I'm claiming fair use to cover the images, audio and video clips contained in this review. They're here to give background and illustrative information regarding the topic. I acknowledge that all material belongs to the copyright holders. I highly encourage the purchase of all books, Blu-rays, DVDs and CDs mentioned in this review. Help the artists out, you won't regret it. So, we're about to go back in time to the darker side of 80s pop culture. Hang on to your hats kids, it's gonna get weird. Welcome back, and today I'm making my first sequel video. Last January I released episode 6, which looked at the book Scarred for Life Volume 1 The 70s, and the video ended like this. <laughs> Look what landed in the post today, just as I was finishing off this video. See you soon! Now, finally, after over 12 months, I'm ready to cover Scarred for Life Volume 2 The 80s Part 1. As you'll know from previous episodes, I'm a true child of the 80s. It was the decades that I grew up in, and a lot of the content in here I experienced during my formative years, which explains a lot about me. I'm really looking forward to covering this book. It's going to be a true stroll down memory lane. So, without further ado, let's dive in and see what delights, or horrors, the 80s has to offer, and how this book led to me returning a couple of episodes of Missing Television. <laughs> Like its predecessor, Scarred for Life, Volume 2, written again by Stephen Brotherstone and Dave Lawrence, is a hefty beast. It covers 530 pages, which is less than the 70s volume, but you still wouldn't want to drop it on your foot. I did mention that this is just part one of their coverage of the 80s. Part two was announced last August. Now, it was scheduled for a December release, but it hasn't materialised as of yet. They did, however, release the index pages on their Facebook group last year, and there's some sections that I'm really looking forward to reading. Now, if you want to know what they are, type in Scarred for Life in Facebook and join their group. In this volume, they've brought in additional contributions from Jez Connolly, Mark Cunliffe, James Hent, Neil Mitchell, Helena Nash, Andrew Orton, and Chris Orton. The introduction was, again, written by author Johnny Maines, and he gives us some insight into growing up in a turbulent household in the 80s when his viewing habits were limited but influential. He recounts sneaking watches of horror programming like Halloween 3 and The Beast Must Die on the television. He discusses the influence on the political situation and rapid changes of the decade that were reflected on the TV. He concludes the introduction by recounting a tale about picking up a copy of the show Chucky and watching it with his young daughter. Heartwarmingly, he mentions that she liked it so much that he got as much enjoyment from watching her reactions to it as he did from watching the show himself. Truly a testament to the staying power of these classic shows. As a postscript, he mentions that, after his revelation of not watching or liking Doctor Who, one of his fellow authors took it upon himself to rectify that and introduce him to some Tom Baker classics. Now, I wonder if he was persuaded by any of them. Anyway, enough of that. Let's see what's inside the book. The book has nine main chapters, with several sub-chapters included within them. After an introduction by Stephen Brotherstone, putting the contents of the book into the context of the decade, we come to chapter one, called, you know for kids. This covers some of the more nightmare inducing fare that was offered up to children such as Look and Read, Nosy Bonk, Drama Rama, Grange Hill and Nightmare. Chapter 2 is called Future Shock and covers Doctor Who, Blake 7, V and Day of the Triffids amongst others. Chapter 3 is called Grand-ish Grinall and looks at 80s television horror and suspense shows, including Tales of the Unexpected, Salem's Lot, and the original Woman in Black. This concludes with a special interview with Darren Brown collaborator and star of the stage show slash film Ghost Stories, 
Andy Nyman. Chapter 4 is called Scream Victoria and looks at shows like Moondial, The Children of Green Now and The Watch House along with some others. Chapter 5 is called Surreal Drama and looks at the likes of Edge of Darkness, Brimstone and Treacle and The Singing Detective, the sort of dramas that I was too young to watch at the time. Chapter 6 is called Channel Swore and looks at the problematic, edgy, new kid on the block, Channel 4 and its output, including Mini Pops, Red Triangle Films and its bizarre and often disturbing animated offerings. Chapter 7 is called Dole Drama and explores the shows and characters that reflected the tragic reality of many in Thatcher's 80s Britain. Chapter 8 is called How We Used to Live and looks at things like Bizarre 80s Adverts, Page 3 Pinups, The Rabies Scare and Joey Deacon, a disabled gentleman featured on Blue Peter and the source of many a cruel schoolyard insult. Finally, Chapter 9 concludes with the terrifying public service announcement films of the 80s, including Drinking and Driving, The Green Cross Code, AIDS and The Dangers of Smoking. And the book rounds up with Reader's Scars, in which people share their nightmare memories from the decade, along with an afterword from Brother Stone and Lawrence. As a kid, I was blissfully unaware of the politics and hardships that built up the 80s. Newsround and Blue Peter felt like they were for the boring, swatty kids, and I was also never really into the gritty kids-based dramas either, aside from Grange Hill. However, with the benefit of hindsight and becoming more politically aware, it was utterly fascinating to read about the dramas in the 80s, dealing with the social and political climate of the time. The authors of the book really know their stuff. As with my video for Volume 1, there's way too much for me to cover from this book. So, I'm just going to pick things that resonated with me growing up as a child in the 80s. I can't emphasise enough though that if you've got any interest in 80s films, television, music or any aspect of pop culture, you should definitely pick up a copy of this book. There's a link in the description below. By the way, this review is completely independent of the authors and publishers. I do these reviews of anything that I find interesting and this book ticks all my boxes. Anyway, moving on. In primary school, under the teaching broadcasts, was a show called Look and Read. It was hosted by a floating alien creature called Wordy, who helped to teach us English. The majority of the show focused on multi-part dramas which featured a read-along section. There were two stories in particular that freaked out children of my age, Dark Towers and The Boy From Space. The Boy From Space was pure nightmare fuel, simply because of the tall, thin spaceman. A malevolent, stalking alien played by John Woodnut, who pursued the child actors of the drama relentlessly with an unnatural jerky walk. His silver face, menacing stare, and language composed of reversed English gave a lot of us sleepless nights. The second drama, Dark Towers, immediately caught my interest by being about ghosts. The title sequence set the mood with looming shots of the exterior of the mansion, before moving into cobwebbed rooms and ending with a shot of the mansion all in the dark. All whilst children's TV presenter Derek Griffiths sang about the mysterious and foreboding building in a theme tune which featured atmospheric violins and a tinkling piano. Come and listen to the call of Dark Towers. There were haunted paintings that warned the protagonists of danger, a friendly ghost who turned out to be the man in the painting, and finally, the one that scared us all, the glowing tall knight. He was nothing, though, compared to this next reprobate of children's television. Every so often, a character comes along for a kid's show that makes you think that the designer must really hate children. I am, of course, referring to Nosy Bonk, a slapstick character from the show Jigsaw, with a mask containing a ridiculously long nose, wide staring eyes and rictus grin, 
he would not have looked out of place in a horror film. There's also something about him wearing a dinner suit with the white gloves that amplifies the creepiness. He was created and played by presenter and mime artist Adrian Headley as an innocent slapstick character, the look of which was apparently based on a carnival mask owned by Headley that he acquired in Switzerland. Apparently, the BBC thought that the mask was too unsuitable and created their own. It's said that in doing so, the BBC made it unintentionally more horrifying and phallic than the original. There's three pages devoted to the character, with background information, his genesis and influence. There was a rather sad story from Headley regarding a mask from his childhood, which may have planted the seed for Nosy Bonk all those years previously. Before the advent of the internet, Nosy Bonk lived in our memories as a half-forgotten bogeyman. Now, thanks to YouTube, he lives again to unnerve a whole new generation. I also believe that fellow YouTuber, Stuart Ashen, created a horror series called Nosy Bonk Returns. So check that out later. As mentioned in the previous Scarred for Life episode, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan. My love of the show began in the 1980s. Tom Baker started his final season in August of 1980 and handed over to Peter Davison in March of 1981. Tom Baker terrified me. Each time the theme tune started and his face appeared in the star field, I'd run upstairs screaming. My parents persuaded me to give it another chance owing to the fact that Peter Davison, accompanied by his then-wife Sandra Dickinson, had performed the theme song for my favourite kids' show at the time, Button Moon. I gave it another chance, and it's safe to say that few other shows have had such a lasting impact on my life as this one has. There's a section in the book in which Brother Stone and Lawrence each choose their top five scariest or grossest moments from 80s Who. I'm not going to reveal the whole list, you'll have to buy the book for that, but... I've chosen four of their choices, which I'll go through in no particular order. Starting with this one. The Doctor, Peter Davison, becomes embroiled in a Dalek plot to rescue their creator Davros from a prison ship and use him to correct a weakness they've developed against a weaponized virus. This Doctor Who serial is reputed to have a higher body count than the original Terminator film. Script editor Eric Saywood wasn't shy about amping up the violence, a propensity which would plague the series through Colin Baker's era. The scene detailed in the book concerns an attack on a prison ship in space, in which Davros is held captive. The Daleks are overcome, but their human allies launch a biological attack, causing the ship's crew to die whilst mutating. The final shots of the corpses laying there with their faces dissolved wouldn't have looked out of place in an 80s horror film. However, it's the scene in which one unfortunate crew member turns to the camera, his face and hands melting away, which is the most disturbing of all. His terrified shout of, What's happening to me? is body horror the likes of which David Cronenberg would be proud of. This began Doctor Who's overt violent streak, an issue that would be used as justification for its cancellation a short while later. If I were to tell you that I'd watched a story that contains cannibalism, torture, and the concept of snuff films, you'd probably presume I was talking about an 18 rated horror. But no, this was Doctor Who that went out at 20 past 5 on a Saturday evening. With the show involving a scene in which the hero is almost dispatched in an acid bath, it's no wonder the likes of Mary Whitehouse had a fit of conniptions. The Doctor and his companion Perry, played by Colin Baker and Nicola Bryant, land on a run-down planet which is exploited by capitalist slug aliens for a rare and precious mineral. The populace are subdued and distracted by televised torture and executions. This is Doctor Who exploring the issues of video nasties, which were prominent at the time. Having been mistakenly pronounced dead due to succumbing to a hallucination, making him think he was dying of thirst in a desert, the Doctor's body is taken to be disposed of in an acid bath. 
For years, before a commercial release, it was received wisdom that the Doctor callously pushes the attendant in to escape. This solidified Colin Baker's portrayal as the Nasty Doctor. However, that's clearly not the case. As you can see, the Doctor defends himself and the attendant's colleague pulls him in to suffer the same grisly fate. Still, death by acid bath wasn't going to dissuade anyone who accused 80s Who of being too violent. Nonetheless, this is a belting story from a criminally underrated Doctor, and is well worth checking out. The Doctor, again played by Colin Baker, lands on a funeral planet to pay respect to his late friend Arthur Stengos. It's not long before he's mixed up in a plot involving body snatching, assassins, cannibalism, again, and Daleks. This is Doctor Who doing Soylent Green with Daleks. The scene in question involves one of the alleged body snatchers, the daughter of Arthur Stengos, who believes something was not quite right when she was denied permission to view his body. After fighting her way down to the catacombs, she comes face to face with the disembodied head of her father, who is in the process of becoming a Dalek. The conditioning affects his mind, and he alternates between screaming the Dalek ethos of extermination and supremacy, and begging his daughter to kill him. The soundtrack, including a rising synth sting, along with a quickening heartbeat effect, makes this one of the creepiest scenes ever shown on Doctor Who. I remember watching the scene as a kid, and it really freaked me out. The pulsating brain, bits of gooey fat, and wires sticking into him was horrific. Strong stuff to be broadcast at 20 past 5 on a Saturday evening, but absolutely fantastic, though. Just what Doctor Who should do. Oh, somebody gets stabbed in the heart with a syringe in the same story. So, it's little surprise that Colin Baker's era came under fire for excessive violence. Nonetheless, this is another fantastic adventure, with a great guest spot from Alexi Sale, and is well worth watching. The next scene stars Sylvester McCoy as the Seventh Doctor, from a story which is a stone-cold classic. It sees the Doctor and Ace, played by Sophie Aldred, land in a military base in World War II. They become embroiled in a plot concerning a German deciphering machine, Norse mythology, an ancient godlike entity the Doctor trapped centuries ago, and vampires, called hemivores within the story to get round the no horror diktat. Having repelled one set of hemivores through his unshakable faith in his companions, the Doctor and Ace along with the help of local reverend, played by Nicholas Parsons, are racing to stop the deciphering machine from translating ancient Norse engravings. However, they're too late, and the translation raises the vampiric hemivores from the sea. It's a great introduction to the creatures. Reminiscent of the sea devils from the 70s story of the same name, they do look suitably grim, with swollen blue faces, Fragments of exposed skull showing through, and barnacles clinging to them. Sylvester McCoy got a bad rap as the Doctor. His first series was rushed and emphasised the comedy, which was no fault of McCoy's. His final two seasons, though, showed the actor really getting to grips with the part, and reintroducing some of the mystery of the character, with help from the new script editor, Andrew Cartmel. The Curse of Fenric, Ghost Light and Survival all showed a renewed vigour and direction for the show and character. But it was curtailed by a disinterested BBC and wouldn't return until the 1996 Paul McGann TV movie. Doctor Who came in for a lot of flack in the 1980s. Those who grew up with John Pertwee and Tom Baker criticised the stories, casting and direction of the show. Indeed, the top bosses of the BBC had the knives out for the programme as well. Michael Grade saw it as a show way past its prime and overdue for the chop. When he failed to cancel it outright in 1985, they neutered it on its return with a diktat of less horror and more comedy. It soldiered bravely on and experienced a brief renaissance until 1989, when it was quietly rested without fuss or fanfare. 
However, thanks to legions of dedicated fans, including Russell T. Davis, Mark Gatiss, Paul Cornell and Stephen Moffat, the show lived on in novels, CDs and comics. For kids like myself and my buddy Carl Flanagan, thanks very much for tuning in, mate. The show was frightening, exciting and started a passion which is still going strong to this day. Many episodes from the early years of television are now lost to the mists of time, Doctor Who being the most famous amongst them. This was done for storage reasons, contract issues and to recycle tape. Nobody saw any commercial use in these old black and white episodes and colour television had just arrived. Home media wasn't even conceived of at the time. What is shocking though is that some shows were still being junked up until the early 90s. This book helped lead to the return of a couple of missing episodes from another TV show that me, of all people, had. How did this come about, you ask? Well, there's a section in the book looking at children's series, Drama Rama. Remember that? If not, maybe this will jog your memory. This was an anthology series for kids. Some weeks it could be a comedy, some it could be a straight drama, but some could be spooky or downright terrifying. And these were the ones that I tended to look out for. There was an episode in which a young boy is convinced that there's an opposite world, similar to ours, on the other side of his mirror. In the end, it turns out that he's right and ends up trapped there whilst his reflection takes his place. The penultimate scene of the boy's reflection, incarnate, standing at the front door, staring down at the protagonist's friend with mirrors for eyes and talking backwards, stayed with me to this day. David, you listen to me. You don't touch that mirror, OK? E. Rock Greg. Gregory. Greg. What? But that was nothing compared to the mouth. The book describes it as once seen, never forgotten, and I can attest to that. The show terrified me as a kid, and I'm not alone either. Whilst in college, my friends and I were talking about the TV and film that freaked us out as kids. I happened to mention this episode, and, to my surprise, my mate Kelly said that she'd had the same reaction to it. The fear was real, eh, Kel? For years, I thought the show was actually called The Mouth, but... Internet searches under this title proved completely fruitless. As it happens, it was actually called A Young Person's Guide to Going Backwards in the World, and was a rather lovely, surreal drama about a young person's anxiety of leaving school and worrying whether he'd end up on the scrap heap. This was obviously inspired by the record unemployment of Conservative Britain under Thatcher in the 80s. All of this subtext was lost on seven-year-old me, all I saw was a show in which a wicked woman tried to persuade a boy to climb into a giant mouth so it could eat him. Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the mouth. You can see what a hell of a lot of fun it is. By walking on this escalator here, see, we keep the mouth in operation. Of course, we don't go anywhere, as you can surely observe, because we're walking the wrong way. But it is by these very efforts, our efforts, that we perpetuate the good mouse existence. And every so often, the escalator stops. And our efforts are well rewarded with trinkets and much that is wonderfully useless and pretty. And then we start again, as you may guess. And I guess you may guess because you were clever enough not to flunk. And privileged enough to be coming to the mouth. And so we start again. Oh, it's so lovely. It's beautiful and warm and pretty. Very pretty. Very, very pretty. Well, I guess that's it. See you soon, Charlie. Oh, by the way, have a nice day. Charlie! What really freaked me out was a sequence in which two people who had escaped from the mouth show the boy the truth about being inside it. We have to show you something. See? Look! Hi, Charlie. Welcome to the mouth. You can see what a hell of a lot of fun it is. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Have a 
Those blank masked people absolutely terrified me and haunted my imagination for years to come. I hunted high and low for a copy for years with very little success. Eventually I got lucky and made contact with the author of the show, along with the episodes A Young Person's Guide to Getting Their Ball Back and Conundrum. I explained the impact that the show had had on me and he was gracious enough to send me a DVD containing his three episodes. As soon as I read about this episode in the book, I got in touch with the authors, mentioning that I had copies of these shows. Shortly afterwards, I received a message telling me that a couple of these episodes had been classified as missing from the archive. There was a small flurry of attention, and I was contacted by a chap from Kaleidoscope, a UK company dedicated to the preservation of archived television. I arranged for the disc that I was given to be sent over to them so that I could contribute and fill in the gaps of the series that may otherwise have still been considered missing. It just goes to show that these things can turn up in the most unexpected places and there may still be hope of further archive recoveries. So far I've only covered a tiny sample of what the book has to offer. Like I said in my review of Volume 1, to cover everything in the book, this video would probably have to be about two hours long at least. I've not even covered Grange Hill, The Moomins, Chucky, Nightmare, The Woman in Black, V, Red Triangle Films, Page Three Girls and 80s Police Dramas. You'll have to read the book to find out what's been written about them. And it really is a great read, which evokes the flavour of the decade and gives a fantastic overview of the shows and the impact they had. Before I wrap up, I'm just going to touch on a couple of other things that I covered in the book. As it should have become clear by now, horror films are a major influence on me. There's certain films, though, that I watched as I was entering my teenage years that left an indelible mark on me. One such film that gets a good five-page write-up is Salem's Lot. Toby Hooper miniseries based on the Stephen King vampire novel of the same name. The film starred David Soule, Bonnie Bedelia, James Mason and Reggie Nolder and was vastly different to the Hammer vampire films shown on television at the time and has some utterly terrifying scenes in it. along with this one too. The director, Toby Hooper, was no stranger to horror with his 1974 masterpiece, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And, despite a chequered film career, Salem's Lot stands as one of Hooper's highlights. Originally broadcast over two nights on BBC One, I'm reliably informed by my parents, and backed up by the book, that it was so unlike any previous vampire film that it dominated conversations and terrified the viewers for days afterwards. The nearest comparable broadcast I can think of was Ghost Watch, which was shown in 1992, episode 4 guys, Vampires were still mostly associated with Christopher Lee or Bella Lugosi, all nobility, tuxedos and capes, charming but deadly, living in castles above frightened villagers. Barlow, the chief vampire in this film, was vastly different. Modelled after Max Schreck from 1922's Nosferatu, there was no charm or romance to this cadaverous ghoul. He never speaks in the film, only grunts and snarls. James Mason's Straker acts as both watchdog and voice for the creature. And it had one of the creepiest introductions that I'd ever seen as a kid and scared the hell out of me. <laughs> Salem's Lot brought the vampire into modern day. 
The film trades in a castle for a rundown haunted house, and the victims were just ordinary people like you and me, instead of sackcloth villagers or Victorian gentry. Salem's Lot ranks in my top five vampire films that I've ever watched. It's iconic and atmospheric. At three hours long, it might feel a little slow paced to a modern audience, but it's definitely worth sticking with. Still, there's a remake coming later on this year if you need something a little bit more modern. I must have watched this when I was about 11 or 12. It was certainly at the start of my interest in horror films. But it scared me so much that I ended up borrowing the crucifix that we had hanging on the wall. And I slept with it under my pillow for about two weeks until my parents made me put it back. Thankfully, in that time, I remained vampire free and felt confident enough to comply. I can't recommend Salem's Lot highly enough. Um, catch it if it's streaming or pick it up on DVD or Blu-ray. Throughout the 80s, advert breaks were like Russian roulette. You never knew what advert or public service announcement film would pop up next to traumatise you. A lot of the public service films that I talked about in the original video from the 70s were still being shown throughout the 80s. However, there was a whole new set of weird and terrifying ads and shorts to unsettle you. Starting off with this evil little sod advertising Kinder Eggs. Yodel yum and choco scrum with multi pop from dies! Oh, grubbly! I saw this as a kid and it was pure uncanny valley. A nightmare hybrid of human and egg talking gibberish. It freaked me out generally, but especially when he threw himself backwards off the wall at the end because I thought that he'd smashed and killed himself. Chock a doobie! Chock a doobie indeed, you creepy little bugger. Next up is the Man of Steel. Yes, Superman himself, fighting evil villain Nick O'Teen, a wrong un whose goal is to get kids hooked on smoking. <laughs> As a kid, the message got through that smoking was bad for me, and they gave Nick a real malevolence in pushing the cigarettes onto kids. Just try one. Thankfully, Superman turns up and does his thing and sends Nick packing. Take one of these! I seem to recall that my uncle gave me a promotional poster of Superman and Nick back in the day, but that's long gone now. Now, I've been unable to verify it, but that definitely sounds like Valentine Dial doing the voice of Nick. Finally, a public service announcement film called Andy Lights the Fire. This one stayed with me for years and horrified me because I thought that the kids would be trapped in the burning house. Andy, the fire! I refused to light a fire for years growing up as I was convinced that I would burn the house down if I did. This, along with an episode of Faulty Towers, were enough to petrify me of fire growing up. Elaborating on Faulty Towers, it was the episode The Germans, hailed as one of the funniest episodes in comedy history, Except there's that one part that scared the hell out of me. Spanish waiter, Manuel, accidentally starts a fire in the kitchen. And when he runs out to tell Basil Faulty, he pushes him back in and holds the door shut, unaware that there is a genuine fire, having previously been forced to explain the subtleties between the fire and burger alarms to some slack-jawed guests. This horrified me as I was convinced that he'd burn to death in there. Luckily, Faulty realises and lets him out, but to this day it still gives me a knot in my stomach. There's so many more that the book covers here, from Stranger Danger to Heroin Warnings and the Emerging AIDS Crisis. You know, everything you need for a cosy fireside read. However, I think I'll leave it here though. So that's a very brief glance at some of the contents that I'm personally acquainted with from the book. However, that simply scratches the surface and there's plenty more to fascinate, horrify, and remember between the covers. There's a link below in the description to order the book, and I can't recommend it highly enough. There's plenty in here that should be familiar to us folk who grew up in the 80s. And, even if you didn't, it's still a brilliant buy for fans of cult TV, films, and 80s pop culture in general. It really gives a clear snapshot of the cultural landscape of the 1980s. And this is just book one of the 80s. I can't wait for book two to make an appearance. Don't forget to follow them on Facebook and Twitter under Scarred for Life. I believe that they've also been touring around with a show to discuss and promote the books. If they do a show in Liverpool, then I'm definitely going. 
Also, if you've watched episode 6, where I cover Scarred for Life, volume 1, the 70s, you may remember that I talked about a couple of games that I had at the time. Well, since that video was recorded, I was lucky enough to pick up Game of Dracula and I Want to Bite Your Finger. I've played them with my daughter and probably had more fun playing them now with her than I did back then when I was a kid. If you've enjoyed this video, then please do hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And if you'd be so kind, please do leave a comment about the video or your memories from growing up on the 80s. It helps boost these videos in the YouTube algorithm and makes me all warm and fuzzy to know that people are actually enjoying the videos that I'm making. While you're here, why not check out previous episodes of Amazing World of Stuff? Some of the stuff I've covered includes... Episodes 1 and 2 cover the Garbage Pail Kids sticker series, Revenge of Oh the Horrible, and early 90s UK horror magazine, Terror. Episodes 3 and 4 cover cult comedy horror musical, The Phantom of the Paradise, and controversial BBC Halloween drama, Ghost Watch. Episodes 5 and 6 cover cult rock band, Electric Sixers, Kickstart a Christmas album, A Merry Electric Sixmas and Volume 1 of Scarred for Life, looking at all aspects of 70s pop culture. Episodes 7 and 8 cover iconic Generation 1 Transformers villain and action figure, Megatron, and the brilliant documentary about synthwave music, The Rise of the Synths. Episodes 9 and 10 cover a biography comic of new wave rock band Oingo Boingo, and parts 1 and 2 of In Search of Darkness, Two epic documentaries about 80s horror films. Episodes 11 and 12 cover ex-Oingo Boingo lead singer and film composer Danny Elfman's solo album Big Mess. And a three-part comic book mini-series called Jason vs. Leatherface, which pits the villains from the Friday the 13th and Texas Chainsaw Massacre films against each other. And if that's not enough, then there's the 15 second horror film shorts that I've made, along with various music videos and other bits and pieces that I've done. Have a scooch around the channel, see if there's anything else that you like. I really appreciate your company, thanks very much for joining me, always a pleasure. Stay safe gang, and I'll catch you in the next episode. <laughs>